Okay, the, the topic, uh, what I'm going to talk about is um, I'm going to talk about some aspects of American military and foreign policy history in the context of Mises' book, Nation, State, and Economy. That's why I gave it the title, The Political Economy of Imperialism. And it's a big title. You, know, you, could, you could write a big book with a title like that, but, you know, 45-minute lecture. And uh, so in, in Mises' book, you know, published originally in 1919, and, of course, available out, out front for sale, um, here's one, I'm going to start with one quote. He's talking about the imperialists of his day, the, the imperialist, mostly the Europeans. The he says, these imperialistic doctrines, or the doctrines anyway, are common to all peoples today, Englishmen, Frenchmen, and Americans, who marched off to fight imperialism in World War I, are no, are no less imperialistic than the Germans. And so but basically what he's writing about is that, well, yes, World War I, the Germans were blamed for the war and the imperialism and, and so forth. But he's saying that uh, the other Europeans, the Frenchmen, the Englishmen, and the Americans have a history of imperialism also. And as we'll see, uh, a case can be made that um, the, uh, the Americans became uh, imperialistic uh, even before the German government did. And, uh, and so and he starts out, he's talking about the Prussian Empire. He says this, the Prussian Empire that ruled for more than 200 years, he said, quote, had not arisen from the will of the German people, but it was a state of German princes, but not of the German people, princes. Okay, you know, so much for, uh, you know, we are the government, you know, the, one, the sort of theory that you're, the Americans are taught in the, in the civics class is, you know, you are the government. <laughs> but uh, Mises wasn't going for that at all. And he said that the German people acquiesced in this. They went along with this as long as there was what he called sufficient prosperity and military pomp, a prosperity that had nothing to do with the political and military successes of the German state. But the prosperity was associated with the militarism of the German state by the German state. So a lot of the people thought the reason why they were prosperous was that they were at war all the time. They, 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 it was the militarism, okay? And Mises said the successes of, of the capitalist development were falsely ascribed to the efforts of the state instead of the, the individual, the market participants. And he understood also that a prerequisite to create this kind of militaristic state was uh, uh, to wage an ideological campaign against liberalism. He said this, to the status school of economic policy, an economy left to its own devices appears as a wild chaos into which only state intervention could bring, could bring order. And he goes on to say, for all the difficulties that confronted the German people at home and abroad, the military solution was re recommended. Only ruthless use of power was considered rational policy. These were the German political ideas that the world has called militarism. So he starts out talking about the Prussian Empire and uh, militarism. And he also distinguishes between uh, what he called the, the princely state and the, fr <clears throat> the free state. The princely state, this is, this is you know, early 20th century Misesian language, princely, princely. That's why uh, Mises is kind of hard to read by, from, you know, by modern st standards sometimes. The princely state uh, is all about this, the more land, more subjects, more revenue, and more soldiers. Only in the size of the state, the size of the state, does assurance of its preservation lie. Smaller states are always in danger of being swallowed up by larger ones. So that's Mises' characterization of the thinking of the advocates of what he called the princely state. And then he points out, though, uh, that there are a lot of smaller states that have existed uh, even during his time just as long as the large states of his time. And, but with a free state, by contrast, with a free state, there are no conquests, no annexations, and it forces no one against his will into the structure of the state. It's voluntary. The state, the state is voluntary. Okay. Secession is a hallmark of a free state, uh, said Ludwig von Mises. He said this in, the, in this book, when, when a part of the people of the state wants to drop out of the union, any, any union, liberalism does not hinder it from doing so. 
colonies that want to become independent need only to do so in a free state. Okay, so that's those are some choice quotes that I wanted to start out with about uh, from Mises in the nation, economy, and state about uh, imperialism. And now if you uh, look at um, Ameri some aspects of American history through this lens, uh, I would say that uh, the, the biggest proponent of the ideas of the free state would be, in American history, would be Thomas Jefferson. And, you know, a few quotes, quotes from him. In his first inaugural address, he said this, if there be any among us who would wish to dissolve the Union, let them stand undisturbed as monuments of the safety with which error of opinion may be tolerated where reason is left free to combat it. So it was sort of a defense of free speech and secession at the same time in his first inaugural address. And as soon as Jefferson was elected president, uh, New Englanders started plotting to secede from the Union. And they actually they held a secession convention in Hartford, Connecticut in 1814, and they ultimately decided against it. But they debated it in, uh, for, for that, that whole time. And the leader of that movement was Massachusetts Senator Timothy Pickering. He was George Washington's Secretary of State and Secretary of War and a senator from Massachusetts. So this was uh, a very prominent uh, person who was the leader of the New England secession movement. And Jefferson was asked uh, by uh, a John, John C. Breckinridge. There are a couple of Breckinridges in history in the, in the 19th century. This was John C. Breckinridge. And asked him uh, what he made of this New England secession movement. And Jefferson wrote back and said this, that he said, if there is to be a separation, then God bless them both. That is both sections, both countries. Okay. He said, and keep them in the union if it be for their good, but separate them if it be better. Okay, as Mises said, no one is forced into the structure of the state in a free state. There was another letter that he wrote to a Dr. Dro Joseph Priestley uh, about a year later, who was, who was writing him on the same subject, what do you make of these New Englanders who want to secede from the union? And, uh, and, and they were talking about a, creating a, an Eastern Confederacy, New England, basically, and a Western Confederacy, which is everybody, every place else. And Jefferson said, those of the Western Confederacy will be much, as much our children and descendants as those of the Eastern. And I feel myself much identified with that country in future time as with this one. And did I now foresee a separation at some future day I should feel the duty and the desire to promote the Western interest as zealously as the Eastern. And so it's a free state, uh, the unions is voluntary. It would be an abomination to, to force people into a union that they don't want to be into and so forth. Uh, Murray Rothbard in his, his essay of his called Just War, if you're interested in this topic, I recommend reading his essay, on, it's online called Just War, where he, he said this, the central government the U.S. central government, was not supposed to be perpetual. Does anyone s seriously believe for one minute that any of the 13 states would have ratified the Constitution had they believed that it was a perpetual one, a one-way Venus flytrap, a one-way ticket to sovereign suicide? That was Murray Rothbard, the way, the way he put this, uh, this same thing. And at the same time, I would, I would argue that the, uh, the, the, the princely state is personified no better than, uh, than by Abraham Lincoln, as he said, his, his opinions was a diametrically opposed and the opposite of what Jefferson just said. In his first inaugural address, he said, he said this, no state can lawfully get out of the Union. Acts against the authority of the United States are insurrectionary or revolutionary. And in the same speech, he used the words invasion and bloodshed to describe what would happen to any state that attempted to, to, uh, to leave the Union. Okay, there's no voluntary union with Lincoln. And in the same state, in the same speech, by the way, he also uh, uh, supported uh, an amendment to the Constitution that would have prohibited the federal government from ever uh, interfering with slavery. It was called the Corwin Amendment. It had already passed the House and the Senate, and several states had voted to ratify it in uh, uh, and, and Lincoln. And it turns out uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin's big thousand page book on Lincoln, Team of Rivals, the name of the book, she documents the, with, with original sources how this Corwin Amendment came from Lincoln. 
came from Springfield, Illinois. He, he, he ordered uh, Seward, Senator Seward from New York, who had become his Secretary of State, to see to it that the Corwin Amendment made it through the, the Senate, which he did. And then, uh, and then after that, in his first inaugural, ad in his inaugural address, he says, I understand the amendment has passed the House and the Senate, but I haven't seen it. So he lied, you know, you know honest Abe told a big whopper there. He hadn't seen it, he wrote it, and he hadn't seen it. It, was, it came from him, okay? He went on to redefine treason. Treason in the Constitution, Article 3, Section 3, is uh, levying war upon the United States or giving aid and comfort to their enemies, their, their, in the plural, meaning uh, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, Alabama, Virginia, they're, they're waging war on the free and independent states. That's what uh, treason is under the Constitution. Well, Lincoln redefined it basically to mean criticizing him and, uh, and, his, and, and his, uh, his war. And, and of course, the War Aims Resolution of the United States Congress, which I, I, I have in uh, print, reprinted as an appendix to my latest book on Lincoln, The Problem with Lincoln, uh, states very clearly the purpose of the war. Let's see, where is it? It's, it's, okay. it's the first appendix that I, uh, I put in there. where the U.S. Congress announced to the world that uh, this war is not waged upon our part in any spirit of oppression, that's a laugh, nor for any purpose of conquest or subjugation, another, that's funny too, <laughs> nor, nor purpose, and, and, and this is the important part, nor purpose of overthrowing or interfering with the rights or established institutions of those states. Established institutions, they meant slavery, okay, but to defend and maintain the supremacy of the Constitution and to preserve the Union. Okay. Of course, the Union was destroyed because the original Union was a voluntary Union, and it became more like the Soviet Union after the war because it was no, no longer voluntary. You know, ask, ask the Hungarians about that uh, and, you know, their history. Okay. And so, you know, this, you know, starting with that, that's one example of uh, how we, uh, the, the America turned more to the prince, from the free state to the princely state in the language of Mises. More land, more subjects, more soldiers, more revenue. That's, uh, that's what they're about. You know, in contrast to this, you know, Jefferson's writings, the Kentucky Resolution of 1798 is one of my favorite things. It's, I have one quote by Jefferson, uh, uh, framed and it's on my bookcase and I, sh I should do it with this one too. It's from the Kentucky Resolve of 1798. He said, it said that he wrote, resolve that the several states composing the United States of America are not united on the principle of unlimited submission to their general government. Okay. If the people themselves decide that the central government is exercising extra constitutional powers, then its acts are unauthoritative, void, and of no force. And you know, compare that with uh, what Lincoln said about insurrection and 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 so forth. Mises also claimed that uh, the the Marxists of his day uh, were, were uh, you know, he's talking about the Marxists now in this same book, were all for freedom of the press as long as they were out of power. And he's and he's talking and he made, says this about imperialists in general, and this reminded me of the ACLU, which is you know one of the many appendages to the Democrat Party in the United States, and they were you know. They were good champions of free speech for decades, uh, as long as as long you know while the Democrats were largely out of power and didn't control everything like they do now, uh, and all the institutions like they do now. But now that that they uh, that they they're in power, you know, when's the last time anyone heard about the the ACLU defending free speech? When when you know, did they defend did they defend Trump when he was deplatformed by? Uh, by Facebook or anybody else or anything, did they even comment on that? I, I'm not aware of it. It's it's up to fire, you know, uh, in, with the, in the university world to defend that, but the, the ACLU doesn't do that. Okay, so the, and, and so he, this is just an observation by Mises that these imperialistic uh, uh, regimes uh, are, are all favoring free, free speech. The, the political uh, people behind them when they're out of power but uh, not so much when they're in power.
No, I, I have a section, this paper I'm reading from, I have a section on American wars of conquest. Once, once we went, started going down the road of the princely state, well, we, we became uh, imperialistic. Uh, take the invasion of Canada in the War of 1812. Many members of Congress, including Henry Clay, was just one of the main instigators uh, of the war. Uh, and, and Clay, uh, uh, the late Gary North, for years, uh, bugged me to write a book about Clay, since I wrote one about Link, uh, uh, Hamilton and Lincoln, and Clay is sort of the, the man in the middle that connected Hamilton and Lincoln and that, that political regime that they all stood for. And, uh, but, but Henry Clay, uh, when I got, I, I've been researching him, and the latest biography that I read of him praises him to the treetops for being a, a member of the committee that, uh, that uh, negotiated an end to the War of 1812. But they didn't blame him for instigating the War of 1812. He was one of the main instigators in Congress for this. You know, he once said, just the militia of Kentucky alone could defeat Canada. You know, he's, as though he would know anything about it, you know, no military experience whatsoever. Okay, and so it was, it was, the annexation of Canada was clearly uh, desired by by members of certain members of Congress. There was a congressman named Richard Johnson. He said, "I shall never die contented until I see England's expulsion from North America and her territories incorporated into the United States." There was a congressman named John Harper, who said, "The author of Nature himself." God, in case, in case you didn't catch that, <laughs> had marked our limit in the south by the Gulf of Mexico and on the north by the regions of eternal frost. So he's saying, claiming to know what was in God's mind. Before leading his men into battle, a general Alexander Smith said to them, quote, you will enter a country that is to become one of the United States. And so, you know, quite a few prominent political figures and generals uh, knew that even even if the beginning of the War of 1812 was not motivated by uh, the desire to conquer Canada, it it became that. So so it seems anyway. If you if you see what these uh, members of Congress were saying, and then if you look at uh, the Mexican American War in 1846, President James Polk offered to purchase from Mexico land that included Texas, California, Nevada, Utah, Mexi New Mexico, Arizona, Colorado, part of Oklahoma, Kansas, and Wyoming. This was, these were all part of Mexico at the time. That was, that was a big land sale, something, something Donald Trump never even did as far as real estate sales. Well, the Mexican government said no thanks. And so after which uh, Polk claimed that American blood has been shed, had been shed at the hands of Mexican soldiers uh, in Texas uh, somewhere, and so so that that you know justified uh, the invasion of Mexico, and the end result was the Polk administration was able to add all of this territory to the United States, and they wrote Mexico a check for 18 million bucks for uh, for all for all of that land at the time. Okay, and so that's that that seems to fall into the princely state category, I would think. Um, you know, even you know, long before Lincoln came along, so it wasn't you know. I'm not saying that Lincoln initiated this, but I was just uh, I, the point I made was that I wanted to compare Jefferson and Lincoln and their their thinking, ideology there. And and by the way, the Civil War, um, the very interesting little book is by by Robert Penn Warren. Uh, he was asked by Time Magazine in 1960 to write a, a book, you know, it's the, the centennial of the Civil War. And he wrote a little book called The Legacy of the Civil War. And one of the points he makes is that uh, the story of the, that is told of the American Civil War created what he said is a treasury of virtue on the part of the United States government, meaning anything the United States government would do in terms of foreign policy was virtuous by virtue of the fact that it was the United States government that was doing it. Okay, that, that, <laughs> and he said it was used to, ju to justify you know, any and all aggressive wars. And Robert Penn Warren, the famous uh, novelist, and writer, All the King's Men, that Robert Penn Warren, he said uh, moral narcissism became the driving force of American foreign policy 
and justification for our crusades of 1917 to 1918 and 1941 to 1945 and the diplomacy of righteousness with the slogan of unconditional surrender and universal rehabilitation for others, for others. So, uh, so that was Robert Penn Warren, and I think he was he was right on the money uh, for that on that. And if you're interested in this whole topic, that's it's a really interesting little book. He's he was a, a, a just a wonderful writer, Robert Penn Warren. Then I also write a little bit about the Indian Wars after the Civil War, the American Civil War. Literally three months after Robert E. Lee surrendered, uh, Sherman, General Sherman, was put in charge of the, uh, the military district of the Missouri, which was all the land west of the Mississippi. And his job was to kick out the Indians to make way for the uh, government-subsidized transcontinental railroads. And uh, Sherman uh, made a speech where he said this, we are not going to let a few thieving, ragged Indians check and stop the progress of the railroads. He wrote that to Ulysses Grant, who was uh, his, his best friend, his, his buddy, uh, in 1867. Uh, Michael, a, uh, a, a biographer of Sherman, Michael Fellman, said this, The great triumvirate of the Union Civil War effort, Generals Grant, Sherman, and Sheridan, pursued what Sherman called the final solution to the Indian problem. Kind of creepy language, don't you think? The final solution. This is Sherman's language. It's not, it's not Michael Fellman's language. He's quoting Sherman as saying that. And, and this included uh, all these uh, former generals, Lincoln's generals, John Pope, O.O. O. Howard, George Armstrong, Custer, Benjamin, he wasn't a general, uh, Benjamin Garrison, Winfield Scott Hancock, and they eventually killed some 45,000 uh, Indians, Plains Indians. And, uh, and of course, they had to have maimed probably more than double that number as far as that goes in raiding uh, their, their Indian villages in the middle of winter. Usually when, when families would all be together, that's, that's, when, that's when most of the Indian raids happened, when most of the Indians would be together. Now, Mises, on, on this subject, Mises wrote how many of the wars of conquest during his time were against what the imperialists of his time called the lower races, the lower races. Uh, and these are people, Mises says, these are people who the imperialists considered, quote, not ready for self-government and never will be ready for self-government. And so he, he cites British imperialism in India and the Congo and American imperialism against what he called the Asiatic peoples, the Philippines and, the, and places of that sort. And what the U.S. government did with, to the Indians, well, it seems to me, what falls, falls into the same thing that what some of the European powers were doing to what they, can, they called the lower races. And this, here's something that uh, General Sherman said in another letter to, uh, to Grant. He says, the Indians give a fair illustration of the fate of the Negroes if they are released from the control of the whites. So this is after the Civil War. Slavery has ended, and General Sherman is saying that the Negroes need to be controlled by the whites or they will turn into savages and barbarians, in his opinion, like, like, just like the Indians, which he considered to be savages and barbarians. Okay. The, the odd thing about all this, though, is that a lot of ex-slaves joined uh, Sherman's army, the Buffalo Soldiers, they were called, and they were members of Sherman's army, mass killing another uh, colored race uh, for money. Uh, they're celebrated, but I don't think they ought to be. Okay, now Sherman gave his, his lieutenant, his main lieutenant was Sheridan, General Sheridan, who was another Civil War luminary, and he gave Sheridan prior authorization to slaughter as many women and children as well as men when attacking Indian villages. He said it was too, too cumbersome and too time-consuming to distinguish between the men and the women and children. So just kill everybody. And they killed, they killed the horses, the dogs, and, and every, every living thing do it. that was there. And there's a man, uh, the late SLA Marshall, who was the U.S. Army's uh, official military histor historian of the European theater of the war in World War II. So the, the official U.S. Army's history of the European war in World War II 
was written by this man, S.L.A. Marshall, who authored 30 books on U.S. military history. So he seems to me to be quite the authority on U.S. military history. And he said this about Sheridan's orders to Custer. He called them, quote, the most brutal orders ever published to American troops. He was referring to the order to kill everybody, men, women, children, don't distinguish. It's, it's too time consuming to do that. So they would typically sneak up on an Indian village when the families were together. And by that time, they had Gatlin guns, with, you know, a form of a machine gun, uh, you know, artil had artillery, of course, and, uh, and rifle and repeating rifles. And, uh, and they would wipe out entire villages. Okay. <clears throat> the next uh, enlightening story I tell in this paper is uh, the American conquest of the Philippines. I don't really tell the story. It's a very brief description. Well, the Filipinos had just ejected the Spaniards from their country and declared their independence, but the Americans wanted, the American government wanted to get in there instead. And so there was the Philippine insurrection, 1899 to 1902, and according to the history books, some 200,000 Filipinos were killed by American soldiers. Uh, I found a couple of sources that said it may have been as many as a million. No one seems to know for sure, but most of the books say 200,000 or so. 4,000 4, American soldiers also died. And there's a, uh, a, a biography of Teddy Roosevelt written by my friend Jim Powell. It's called Bully Boy. It published in 2006, and he talks about Roosevelt and his role in this. And, uh, he, and Roosevelt denounced the Filipinos as, quote, and he's, he's quoting Teddy Roosevelt now, who Bill Clinton once said, my favorite Republican president is Teddy Roosevelt. And he said, uh, he called the Filipinos Chinese half-breeds, savages, barbarians, a wild and ignorant people, a lesser race, in other words, when Mises talk about how the Europeans uh, uh, conquered the lesser races, that's, that's how uh, the Americans in the early 20th century, refer, or the turn of the century, re referred to the Filipinos. There was a senator named Albert, Albert Beveridge of Indiana who was uh, the big war proponent. He said, and he was celebrating once this was accomplished. This is a very short, you know, enterprise. The Philippines are ours forever. The Pacific Ocean is ours. And he, believed, he said it was America's duty to bring Christianity and civilization to savage and senile peoples. Okay, savage, you know, Christianity. The Filipinos had been Catholics for 400 years at that point. And in this, in this, this uh, uh, dimwit Senate, Senator Albert Beveridge makes a speech like that. Okay. Uh, Powell also quotes T.R. as his uh, as his his biggest fan, Bill Crystal calls it, likes to used to like to call him. He said, "Quote: All the great masterful races have been warlike races." So the mass, there's that master race thing. This was before Hitler. But he said, and he denounced. So Teddy Roosevelt denounced the menace of peace in the same speech. Short, shortly afterward, he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> kind of like Obama getting the Nobel Peace Prize two weeks after becoming president. After, you know, never, never could have done anything to deserve it. Okay. Also, during his presidency, T.R., Bill Crystal's favorite uh, Republican in history, plotted against Cuba, Hawaii, Venezuela, China, Panama, Chile, Dominican Republic, Nicaragua, and Canada as well. Now, the Philippine insurrection followed the three-month-long Spanish-American War. Uh, Secretary of State John Jay, who was Lincoln's personal secretary in the White House, but by then he was the Secretary of State, he called it a splendid little war. You know, maybe for him it was, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't for all the people who died in it. Maybe for him it was. And I, I, if any of you, if the students, if you're interested in, in doing some reading on this, there's a uh, the, the, the great libertarian Yale University sociologist, William Graham Sumner, uh, you know, one of my favorite short little essays in this whole area is The Conquest of the United States by Spain by William Graham Sumner. And so it's online. You can, you can read it, uh, you know, while you're sitting there even. And just to tell you some of the things that, that Sumner said in this. He said... Uh, 
Let's see. He said this, this war, the Spanish-American War, uh, uh, ushered in a new foreign policy direction of, quote, war, debt, taxation, diplomacy, a grand governmental system, pomp, glory, a big army and a navy, lavish expenditures, political jobbery, and a word, imperialism. Sounds like today, doesn't it? Sounds like the U.S. government today. Okay. And here's another thing that Sumner said. He said this, my patriotism is of the kind which is outraged by the notion that the United States never was a great nation until in a petty three months campaign, it knocked into pieces a poor, decrepit, bankrupt old state like Spain. Okay. And then he goes on to say, the people were bearing the burdens of the imperial system and the profits of it went into the treasury, which in the case of Spain was the hands of the king. And so now we, the United States is going down that same road. So he's saying the United States is becoming like Spain. That's why the title of the article is The Conquest of the United States by Spain. And he said, you know, this system of jobbery, which uh, uh, Patrick Newman would call cronyism, I think, uh, jobbery. It was the old word, jobbery, uh, would create enormous profits for a few schemers. Sound familiar? Uh, yeah. You know, Hunter Biden, call your office. Uh, at the expense of everyone else in society in terms of blood and treasure, uh, uh, we're like constituting a grand onslaught of democracy, on, demo on democracy. That's uh, William Graham Sumner. And I also tell a little story in this paper I'm reading from about Hawaii. In the early 1890s, American businessmen in Hawaii wanted the government to declare it an American province. There's a lot of money to be made in there. Uh, there was a man named Dole who was very interested in, not Bob Dole. It was, it was kind of name, the Dole pineapple guy. Okay, and uh, I don't know if I can pronounce this name. The Hawaiian queen. Uh, yeah, I'll give it a try. Uh, Lilio Kalani. That's not too bad. Queen Lilio Kalani. She attempted to stave off the American imperialists by creating a new constitution. But then uh, the, the Americans who wanted to take this over created something called a Committee of Safety. Now, there's an Orwellian <laughs> phrase for it, safety, Committee of Safety. It's, it's dangerous to be living in Hawaii, so they, you need the Americans to come in there and make you safe. Uh, and they, they raised an army called the Honolulu Rifles. And the queen was gone by that time, and there was a king, a Hawaiian king. And the Honolulu Rifles, thugs with guns, supported by the U.S. government, forced the Hawaiian king at gunpoint to sign a new constitution. It became known as the Bayonet Constitution. And so, uh, you know, uh, Marlon Brando in The Godfather was not the first one to hold a gun to somebody's head and say, your signature or your brains will be on this piece of paper. It was it was the uh, the Honolulu Rifles did it long before the mafia, uh, long before the Italians even came to America, as, as far as that goes, in in large numbers. So so this happened. They took over this constitution. They disenfranchised it disenfranchised all Asians, as an inferior race, along with most others, except for the you know, wealthy American landowners. They pretty much took over Hawaii. And, uh, you know, this is even you know, the turn of the century. It took until 1959 that Hawaii became a, a state. And here's the, here's the odious Teddy Roosevelt again commenting on, on this. He gave a speech to a Boston audience in 1895 because what happened was Grover Cleveland got elected president shortly after this, and he was against, he, he was against occupying Hawaii. And so he sort of stalled things for a couple of years, but only for, for a short while. And then, <clears throat> you know, blustery Teddy Roosevelt, who Tom Woods said journalists loved Teddy Roosevelt. And the only reason Tom could think of is that they liked his big teeth. He had real big teeth. You know, he smiled, and his teeth they looked like a horse. He had horse teeth. So I, he, he, <laughs> Tom said, I think they liked his big teeth, Tom says. But, uh, who knows? <clears throat> who knows? Uh, and... Uh, but anyway, he said, <clears throat> Teddy said, I feel it was a crime against the white race that we did not annex Hawaii three years ago. That is, uh, Grover Cleveland stood in the way. Okay. <clears throat> That's what a, what a guy, Teddy Roosevelt. Now, um, 
Mises further says that um, these other nations that he writes about, you know, the, the European nations, yeah, yeah, they they uh, conquered all these these places, the, the lower races, as they called it, in the tropics and the subtropics. But eventually, the Germans, he said, they quote directed their imperialistic policy against European peoples also. So they had to come up with a new reason, a new rationale. The old rationale was, well, we want to civilize and Christianize and and bring democracy to these to these people, these savages. Uh, but now when they start they start invading other European countries, well, what's the rationale for that? Well, the, then, then the rationale becomes the unified state, according to Mises. He says, to justify the application of imperialist principles in Europe against, against the white Europeans, the German theory saw itself compelled to fight the nationality principle, which was more friendly toward classical liberalism, that is, sovereignty, and replace it with the doctrine of, quote, the unified state, okay? St small states were, were said to no longer have any justification for their existence. And, and this is where Mises points out that, well, if you, if you look at history, there were a lot of small states that existed for a very long time, you know, just like the big states. You know, but they, they came up with this theory saying, well, you know, they're, uh, you know, democracy and, and, and so forth will disappear unless it's a, there's a big unified state. And, and, of course, it sounds a lot like Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, doesn't it, uh, the, about the unified state, uh, government of the people, by the people, for the people, and, and so forth. And that's what that reminded me of when I read that passage from uh, Mises' writings. I don't think I have any more horror stories other than, well, in terms of the, un the unified state, <clears throat> here's another German uh, author who said this, the individual states of the American Union could not have possessed any state sovereignty of their own, for it was not these states that formed the Union. On the contrary, it was the Union which formed a great part of the so-called states. And the late Joe Sobrin commented on this, this type of reasoning by saying, well, that makes as much sense as saying a marital union can be older than either spouse. You know, that the union, the union of us of states is older than the states. How could that be? Yeah, and and uh, anyway, <clears throat> uh, there, now an American, there's an American politician that said almost the exact same thing. And, and this, this German politician that I just quoted quotes this American politician. So I'm going to read you what the American politician said. It's almost the exact same thing. The American politician said, the union, the American union is much older than the constitution. It follows from these views that no state can lawfully get out of the Union. Okay, so the, the, the Union created the states, therefore the states cannot get out of the Union. Who do you think said that? Who, who would like to take a guess? Want to take a guess? Well, it was Abraham Lincoln in his first inaugural address, quoted in Mein Kampf by Adolf Hitler from the first quote. The first quote was Adolf Hitler in Mein, mein Kampf, page 566. And so um, I'm sure you all have a copy, so you can just write, <laughs> go, back, go back, go back there. Um, I wrote a whole article about that actually years ago after, after I after I uh, debated Harry Jaffa, the, uh, the sort of the king of the Straussian neocons, the late Harry Jaffa, and uh, and I knew what he was going to do. I knew because uh, I'd read up, I did a little studied up before the debate. It was at the Independent Institute in Oakland, California, and he invariably would make some kind of smear, like he, when he debated Mel Bradford, he would say, well, Hitler would probably agree with Mel Bradford about his, his position. He'd always bring Hitler into it and the, the Nazis into it so, somehow. And I knew he was going to do that with me somehow. So he did the same. He did something like that. Hitler would probably agree with DiLorenzo. But I remember but I, I had taken a uh, European history class in college, and we actually read parts of Mein Kampf. In, uh, in this history class. And I don't know why this stuck in my head, but I remember there was a whole chapter on federalism and states' rights in Mein Kampf. So I went to Barnes & Noble and bought a, a, a copy of Mein Kampf and walked out with, in it with a brown paper bag. And, <laughs> and, and sure enough, sure enough, I read this. Uh, I read this and, and here's uh, Adolf Hitler uh, praising Abe Lincoln to the treetops for, uh, for destroying federalism in America to make his case for destroying federalism in Germany. You know, many years, many years later, and the unified state. 
So, so we, we ended up with the unified state at, at the barrel of a gun in the U.S. And, uh, and you know, you fast forward all those years, and Hitler was doing the same thing. And I think my uh, time is almost up. Maybe we have uh, one or two questions or something. It's not quite quarter of. I'm not as much of a dictator as Lincoln. Lincoln did well. Okay. It was a, okay, if anybody has a question or a brilliant commentary or anything like that. Yes, sir, how about you? So you mentioned it. Yeah, it's online. Yeah, I think you can go on the Independent Institute, Independent Institute's website. I think they still have it on there somewhere. Okay. What's the title? Well, it's a debate between me and, and Harry Jaffa, J-A-F-F-A. And uh, I haven't looked at it in years. I don't know. I assume the Independent Institute, probably if you go on their search engine on their website, you probably find it. It's on YouTube somewhere. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Just put DiLorenzo Jaffa Lincoln debate and you'll find it on on the web. Um, most other Western nations, as far as I know, historically, they also had slavery, like America, but ended it earlier than we did, but maybe more peaceful. Well, not all earlier. Brazil ended it later. Uh, yeah, Jim Powell, who I mentioned, wrote a whole book called Greatest Emancipations about, uh, in great detail about how all the other countries of the world ended slavery peacefully, and that includes New York, New Jersey, not New Jersey, but... Uh, New England, Pennsylvania, you know, all the all the northern states. There were slaves there, all the states, not as many as in the South, but there were slaves. There were slaves in New York City as late as 1853, uh, and uh, and uh, slavery did not end in New Jersey until January of 1865, when it was forced to end it by the Thirteenth Amendment. And of course, New Jersey was part of the Union all during the Army. They sent soldiers to kill Alabamans uh, to save the Union. And they had slaves the whole time. There were slaves in West Virginia all during the war, and that, that was a part of the Union. But but all the all the other countries of the world found a way to uh, purchase the slaves from the slave owners and then legally end it. And that, that's in that they they did it in different ways. In this book by Jim Powell, it uh, describes all the different ways in which they did it. New York passed a law, you know, I, I think something like 1797 or something like that. It said that the children of slaves would be free upon reaching age 25. So a slave woman that had a baby in uh, 1810, 25 years after that, that child would be free under New York law. But what happened was the slave owners in New York and in New England would sell, would wait till that, that uh, child became 24 years old and then sold it into slavery somewhere else. So they, so they ended slavery, but they did not free all the slaves because they didn't want these people living among them in the North. Uh, Tocqueville, in his famous book, Democracy in America, in his time, 1830s, he, he wrote that the, he, he said the problem of race, as he called it, we call it racism now, he, the problem of race, he said it was oddly worse in the North than it was in the South, even though there were a lot, you know, orders of magnitude more slaves in the Southern states than there were in the Northern states. But yes, England, uh, Britain, England, Spain, France, the Danes, the Dutch all ended slavery peacefully without a war. Um, so on that, my question is that, sorry, um, it, there seems to be more animosity and racial tension in America versus all of these other countries. And I'm wondering if Lincoln's war might have contributed to that. Well, it's a, it's a different world today, so who knows, you know, a lot of reasons for that sort of thing. But uh, in my book, The Real Lincoln, I quote one of Lincoln's officers, a, a Captain Poe, who was a, a military engineer, I believe. Uh, he became a newspaper editor in Washington, D.C. after the war. And I quote him as saying that what happened during Reconstruction, uh, you know, after the war, the U.S. government conquered the southern states, you know, despite what they said in the War Aims Resolution, and the Republican Party ran the southern states. The governor of Louisiana was a, 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 a Republican Party crony who uh, became governor of Louisiana for a couple of years, and he retired with $8 million in the bank. And so it was a pretty good gig if you were a Republican Party political hack in those days. Uh, but Reconstruction, they disenfranchised the white voters for a while and, and registered to vote all the, ex, the male adult ex-slaves. Women didn't have the right to vote back then. And, uh, and, they, and they actually raised taxes, property taxes in South Carolina were 20 times higher in 1870 than they were in 1860. 
And so after destroying the place and what they needed was tax amnesty, they, they increased property taxes by 20 fold in order to, uh, you know, the, the tax collectors would come down there and either you pay them a bribe or they'll take your property. And if you didn't have the money for the bribe, your farm is theirs or your cotton crop was theirs. So there's a lot of theft going on. And a lot of the ex-slaves participated in this because they voted. They voted for a tax increase after tax increase. They, they became pawns of the Republican Party. And then the Republican Party left. Uh, the Reconstruction ended. And you had uh, all of these ex-slaves who had been in cahoots with the Republicans to continue the plundering of the South for 10 years after the war was over. And, uh, and that's you know, one of the reasons why the Ku Klux Klan was created, was to intimidate the ex-slaves out of voting for all these tax increases. That was the origins of that. And so you could, that, and that's, that is, I suspect, why this Captain Poe said that uh, race relations were uh, made you know, infinitely worse because of that. Not so much of the war, but because of what happened during you know, the decade or so of so-called Reconstruction, where you know, almost nothing was done for the ex-slaves by the government. Uh, they, they had the Freedmen's Bureau, but they didn't do much. It was sort of a Republican Party propaganda mill. They rewrote, they rewrote history. They published a lot of books about the, their glorious deeds in the war, but they didn't do much for the ex-slaves. Yeah. Any more time? Was the time up? No. The dictator has spoken. <laughs>